American scientists, Delia and Mark Owens, have lived a dream many people share, but few ever realize, the opportunity to explore wildest Africa. Alone in the vast Kalahari Desert in Botswana, they studied brown hyenas and lions. They made unique discoveries about both species and their prey, which helped them develop an overall plan for the conservation needs of the Kalahari. Unavoidably, they often lived with danger. Get to the back, get to the back. After seven years in the Kalahari, Delia and Mark returned home to continue their studies for graduate degrees at the University of California at Davis, where they organized their research for publication. Keep a lot of different skulls. Yeah. They also wrote a best-selling book, Cry of the Kalahari, about their experiences, a book that brought them into conflict with powerful political forces. When the book was excerpted in Life magazine and condensed in Reader's Digest, Delia and Mark became instant celebrities. They were welcomed as returning heroes in Delia's hometown of Thomasville, Georgia. Thank you for coming by. Just saying. Thank you. Hello. Thanks for coming right. by. Good to see you. Thank you. This one about? Well, it's about um, what it was like to live in isolation for seven years and then come back to this. <laughs> Now their lives are tied to conservation and the research it requires. After four years in the United States, they returned to the Kalahari and a National Geographic film crew went with them. Their fortunes over the next year illuminate the painful choices that face conservationists in Africa today. When Delia and Mark Owens first entered the bush in 1974, they began with only the packs on their backs. I don't know it. Later, as the scope of their research expanded, the Frankfurt Zoological Society provided them with full financial support and an airplane for radio tracking. We've got pins here. We can slip the door off easily. Oh, really? Yeah, no more see. nails? No more nails. Brand new prop. I mean, it's virtually a new airplane. Now they pick up their vehicles in Johannesburg, South Africa. It's 700 miles to the Kalahari. Delia has to drive it without Mark. Gauges until that switch is on. Okay. All right. To my center. Have a good trip. I'll see you up there. Huh? Bye, bye, love. Remember, I'll be flying off the track if you're not up there by Friday night. Huh? It's been 11 years since the Owens first made the trip to Botswana. There, in a 33,000 square mile wilderness, the central Kalahari Game Reserve, in a place called Deception Valley, Delia and Mark first began their seven year study. Mark's flight will take four hours. Delia's drive will take four days. Leaving the last settlements behind, Delia runs all day on a track she and Mark cleared when they first entered the Kalahari. It was almost exactly 11 years ago that we came down this track for the first time ever. But we wanted to find a wilderness that had not been affected in any way by man, a free open place that was like all of Africa used to be. We wanted to identify the conservation problems that it had and then to be able to make recommendations of how it should be saved. During their last years in the game reserve, a severe drought began. Mark knows that the animals in the Kalahari have continued to suffer in their absence. The mixed feelings are, 
I think, come from knowing that the Kalahari, loving the Kalahari as we love the Kalahari, and knowing it as we know it, and yet understanding that it has severe problems uh, in terms of uh, threats to its survival. And uh, we're coming back to see what we can do to ensure that future generations come to love the area and its wildlife the way we love it. The Owens made their camp on an ancient dry riverbed. Slight depressions support islands of trees that offer protection from the searing sun and wind. Valley. Does it ever need rain? First time we came here was covered with springbuck and hemsbuck and beautiful green grass. Many scientists yearn to do research in Africa, but only a minuscule few ever succeed in raising the necessary funds. To get started 11 years ago, Delia and Mark auctioned off all their possessions and flew to Africa with just $6,000. Their early research won the respect of their peers and a first grant from the National Geographic Society. Other grants then helped them conduct the most important studies of hyenas and lions ever undertaken in the Kalahari. At the same time, their role as conservationists led to conflicts with the Botswana government conflicts that would eventually threaten their scientific careers. As Delia nears their former tree island camp, she wonders whether it has been destroyed by storm or fire. <laughs> How you doing? You made it, huh? Yeah. I did too. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> I've been stuck in the mess. Have you really? It wasn't that bad a thing. It would, it would, you would have gotten right out, but it took me three tries. Guess what I have? What? A complete stereophonic sound. Really? A system. To, for calling the to lions? To call the lions. Well, that'd be fun. We can play that tonight. I guess. Oh, I have no also have a male and female uh, mating. Mating. That's a draw. <laughs> <laughs> That's a draw. <laughs> You know, I wondered how I'd mine the dirt. I wondered how I'd mine the, the dust and the grime and everything, but it looks bloody beautiful, oh, it's doesn't great. it? Looks great. It really does. Isn't that great. <laughs> I mean, how could you have a better kitchen? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you. With great relief, they find their camp still intact. They can begin their work immediately. The dry season is beginning, and as grasses on the riverbed wither, antelope will disperse and lions will follow, making it much harder for Delia and Mark to find them. You know, I was saying after the initial reaction, so it, I mean, yeah. it was great to get back, but then you look out, it really looks so bleak. I was just You've got to start looking for lions right away right. and hyenas, because the lions are going to be here and gone. I mean, very quickly. Yeah. A last storm sweeps the dry river and distant shrub-covered dunes. Dawn brings the zoologists a welcome sound. Mark will try to locate the lion from the air as Delia pursues him on the ground. It's amazing, even year after year, the same lions use the same trees to lie up in. And even new lions that take over, old lions use the same trees again. Lord, do you see him? 
Negative, love. Mark searches a tree island where he knows from previous experience Kalahari lions are likely to lie up in the shade for the day. It looks thick from the ground, but up there, I don't know. I may, be very, <laughs> I may be very wrong, but he just, I think that may be what the spring buck were running from when we were up there trying to find him. I think he went out the opposite side of the island, out fox. We'll have to take another job up there. Tracking the lion takes them far from camp, so they spend the night near their last sighting. I love this Swiss Army knife. You can't open it unless you split it. Here, you want me to do it? Yeah, you open it. Which one? This one? That one. Oh. The woman's a genius. Brute force. Mark is up before dawn. He and Delia reason that male lions in the vicinity may feel challenged by the sound of another lion and come to investigate. I don't believe it. there's a bloody lion out here. It actually worked. <laughs> We ought to sit down and make uh, very little commotion because he's looking at it. Yeah, we won't, well, now we don't want to frighten him away now that he's here. Yeah, let's just sit down and not move. Male lions roar to establish claim to a pride and sometimes fight to the death to defend territory. This lion searches for the intruder. Now Delia and Mark will try to get close enough to dart him and collar him with a radio transmitter. Then he can be tracked systematically to determine his range size, social contacts, and prey selection. The lion has left the river plain. They follow his tracks, called spoor. We're coming to the point where he went in, so we should see his spoor pretty quickly. It was up here. He may still yeah. be in there. He may be there. Mark has seen him. Mark has seen I should have marked the spot where we lost him. I didn't think of it. We had him all that way. For half the night, Delia and Mark try to get close enough to the lion to dart him. For three days, the lion eludes them. The crust on the sand is bunched up ahead of the foot, so the foot was falling quite quickly. And so you can see he was a little bit concerned about us still. He's, in, he's here somewhere. He's not. He's got to be here somewhere. I wish I could find his spore. I just got to keep going, I think maybe. If we can get to that clearing and get set up, maybe we can track him in, into it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what good it'll do, though. I mean, he has to come up. He has to be approachable. Well, if we get a dart in him, at least we can track him. Yeah. Frustrated in their pursuit, they try to attract him right up to the truck. Ignoring Delia and Mark, the lion trots by, looking for his supposed rival. Mm. 
Finally, he realizes that the roars are coming from the vehicle. The lion focuses on Mark. Head on, he presents an almost impossible target for a dart shot. In the 20 minutes before the drug takes effect, the lion wanders off. Mark follows his tracks to find him. When lions are immobilized, they stop blinking. Sav keeps their eyes from drying out. Delia and Mark whisper to avoid upsetting other lions in the area. Tooth eruption and wear help the Owens determine the lion's age. It doesn't look like an old lion. He's okay. Be interesting to compare this measurement with the one we took a second ago. Look at the size of that paw. But my loses. I can put both my hands together, and you can't see him underneath. Mark, I'm right here. Get, get to the, uh, Let's get to the car. I'm gonna back off, and if she comes in, I'll dart her. She's probably gonna find the mail. I think she has the mail sent. Knowing that the pride will soon break up, Mark darts other lions to keep track of as many as possible. Collaring each lion takes several hours. As the night wears on, Delia and Mark become giddy with fatigue. <laughs> you were wanting to hit me in the nose all day. You finally got your... Okay. <laughs> Mark, try it like a sophisticated scientist. <laughs> well, we have three lions darted. Another pride, one adult male and two young females, so it was worth it. Nights like this bring Delia and Mark deep satisfaction. Using radio collars to maintain contact, they will spend many other long nights recording observations. They plot lion movements from radio data. Through such painstaking work, they have discovered that unlike lions observed elsewhere, Prides in the Kalahari disband in the dry season, and individual lions range over as much as 1,500 square miles in search of food. Their movements present a conservation problem. Hunters and ranchers shoot many of the lions in the Owens study group when they wander outside the reserve. 
The Kalahari is so dry that most of the time carnivores must obtain all their moisture from prey. The prey, in turn, get their moisture mainly from melons, leaves, and grasses. Mark, we can, we can, yeah. If we just sit real tight, maybe she'll come in. They circle a, a carcass several times because they can't afford to make a mistake that the lions are still close by. Because lions often kill brown hyenas in a situation like this. This is such a rare opportunity. I mean, most people living in Botswana have never even seen a brown hyena. They're so rare, and they're, they're also so secretive and shy that usually they run off when they see a truck. For the size that they are, their jaws are incredibly powerful. Yeah, you know, we've actually seen them pick up 50 pounds chunk of meat and bone and walk three or four miles with it before taking it back to the communal den, as they often do. The Owens were the first to discover that brown hyenas have a very complex social structure. At the communal den, related hyenas share in the feeding of the young and even adopt each other's orphans. When we first began our study of brown hyenas in 1974, the odd sighting suggested that they were solitary scavengers. Yet they lived in a clan as a group, and we couldn't understand why they were social. And then one night, we um, followed a female moving one of her cubs from her small den into a huge communal den. It provides a haven for the cubs and releases the mothers from the duty of protection. They move from one of these large dens to the other, and we don't know which one of these dens they're using at the moment. There's no fresh bones in So often, a zoologist's hopes are disappointed. The den is empty. To anybody else, this just looks like three big holes in the ground. But to us, this is, I mean, this is just so many, represents so many memories and, and discoveries and hard nights of watching empty holes and exciting nights of watching hyenas. This place means so much to us. It may take weeks to discover the clan's new den, but research continuity is crucial. It took the Owens four years to discover that clan members share a communal den. That observation opened doors of understanding to previously inexplicable hyena behavior. From time to time, Delia and Mark fly 100 miles to Maun, a town of native huts and tourist lodges. Here, they can pick up research correspondence and send off manuscripts for publication. This is the crocodile park. Water is so precious in the Kalahari that they always arrive weighed down by dirty laundry. Mound Office Services is their contact with the outside world. It receives and stores mail for people who live far out in the bush. I found it. I've given it to him. Whenever you get a minute, we just come to pick up our mail. But okay. You take your... Behind you is a box with the word Owens on it. Oh, okay. And a okay. big box after it. Okay. okay. That's all yours. Okay. Oh, here. Look. These Birthday are all our people. telegrams. Oh, golly. Okay, wait a minute. It's all... Hey, Tony. Tony. You want to join us? Well, why don't you join us? <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a birthday card for my mother. I know it. You know, and it's fat. What? It's fat. It's fat. That's she usually a good sends sign. vitamin pills. Why is she oh, sending fat? Oh, look. <laughs> Pictures at home. Oh, Ciao. fantastic. That's great. Cut off as they are for months at a time, these bundles of mail are <laughs> precious links with home. Through letters, they share in their family's triumphs and despairs. <laughs> Back at camp again, Delia and Mark are on the prowl, still hoping to find some of the lions they studied four years earlier. The 
cubs seem to sense that something is wrong. Delia and Mark have darted an old lioness. They can tell by the tag in her ear that she is one of the lions they studied before. The lion's whisker pattern will tell them more. Here's one of our old friends. There's just a shard of an ear tag left, just a pin with a little bit of color on either side, right here. Mark, do you know who this is? This is Happy. Happy. This is Happy. Darted first April Happy. 9th, 1978. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe. What a story behind her. One reason we called her Happy is because she, we we recorded her with more males than any other female. <laughs> She'd go from one male to the other. I can't believe it. She's a beauty. Oh, you old bag, you. Finding Happy is an important link to their early research. She helps them learn how prides in the Kalahari form and break apart. Her presence in the same area demonstrates just how crucial the riverbed habitat is to the lion's survival. In order of us receiving them. Uh, Roger, ready to copy. Okay, this one is to Mark Owen. Back at camp, Mark gets a call from his radio contact in Mound. Okay, well, we've got a problem. We received a telex message via radio uh, yesterday that immigration in the capital has rejected our request for a residence permit, which, of course, we need to carry on our research here. So um, we're ha going to have to fly off to Gaborone and try to see what the problem is and try to sort it out. It's a, obviously most disturbing. Before returning to the Kalahari, Delia and Mark had talked to government officials and had been assured all was in order. Delia and Mark would not return to the Kalahari. The Botswana government would expel them from the country. The trees at their camp had sheltered them from desert winds and shaded them from the lethal sun of summer. While they lived here, they made important scientific discoveries and developed plans that they hoped could save wildlife in the Kalahari for future generations. As soon as we entered the office, he said, you have until five o'clock to get out of the country. And I said, well, what about our camp? And he said, if you're here after five o'clock, the law will take its course. We just feel like we've been um, thrown out of our home and it was like somebody had died. It was really, honestly, like someone very close to us had died, and uh, uh, we were mourning that death. A few days later, friends of Delia and Mark fly into the camp to pick up their research data and vehicles. I believe this is a tragedy for Botswana. I can't Probably imagine. Yes that any good could come out of people like Mark and Delia being restrained. They're so dedicated, and they have the interests of the country and the people so much at heart. The Botswana government refused to give the Owens any reason for their expulsion. But almost certainly it concerned their protests over a massive die-off of wildebeest in the Kalahari. In 1979, at the beginning of a long drought in Botswana, Mark had discovered thousands of wildebeest migrating northward. In long drought periods, these antelope must have access to water to survive. Instinct, perhaps, tells them there are perennial sources of water to the north. Now, herds of cattle are grazed in the same area. Disregarding the impact on wildlife, the Botswana government had built fences because some veterinarians believe that wildebeest can infect cattle with foot and mouth disease. The wildebeest were cut off. 
As they traveled north, their natural route was blocked. Thousands died on the fences. Following the scent of water, those with enough strength pushed on around the end of the fences into an area made desolate from overgrazing by villagers' cattle. By the time the wildebeest did reach water, Many were too exhausted to continue. Survivors had to trek 50 miles each day between the water and woodlands where they could graze and escape harassment from poachers. Day after day, hundreds more died. Although wildebeest have not been shown to transmit foot and mouth disease to cattle, Villagers were told that they must not let the wildebeest mix with their herds. Since 1979, more than 200,000 wildebeest have died. Only 30,000 remain. Horrified by the disaster, Delia and Mark alerted the Botswana government. When little was done, they wrote articles and a book reporting this wildlife disaster. For a year, Delia and Mark tried to gain re-entry. Although the government would eventually offer to readmit them, the Owens would decide that in the face of bureaucratic hostility, they could no longer be effective conservationists in Botswana. We came to Africa to find a chunk of what Africa always used to be, uh, a wilderness that was untouched and where a wilderness uh, that we could protect by conducting basic research and devising a conservation program. Besides losing the science, we've now lost what was our home and, and what was our, our uh, reason for working and we wanted so badly to conserve this area and I, I just hope it won't now be lost. I can't think of anything else that has affected me as much personally as the loss of the Kalahari has. And um, I just hope that um, I hope the world won't let it pass. Delia and Mark are determined to continue their efforts to conserve wildlife in Africa. They ask themselves where they can be most effective. Okay, search for a new study site. It's fairly depressing as to how many countries are off limits to us for a variety of reasons. Mozambique has a civil war going on, so we can't go to Mozambique. And uh, similarly, southwest African Namibia in the north is torn with civil strife. We've been warned not to go to Zaire because of um, some populations over here that are still attacking people. There are supposed to be still cannibals there. So we basically are limited to south central Africa, and the country that seems to offer the most promise is Zambia. Delia and Mark set out on a five-day journey to Botswana's neighbor to the north. Zambia's largest national park, Kafui, is 170 miles long. They begin their quest at Ngoma, a tourist and game scout camp. There they will discover wildlife problems common across Africa. Delia and Mark learn about the park from Chief Game Warden Ray Mwenefumbo. They are looking for a research site that needs conservation and where animals are undisturbed by human contact. What's the poaching pressure like? Poaching and the human, human encroachment is, those are the two major problems that I'm having right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, those, these are not real very big problems as far as I'm concerned. I think they're coupled more with me being handicapped with 
enough transport, yes, yes, enough yes, funds yes. to operate, yeah, you yes, know. Yes. Right. I mean, I'm running this park, it's 2,400 square kilometers, it's almost yeah. the size of Scotland. Mm. And I've got one vehicle on myself, yeah. and my senior ranger there has got one vehicle so for me. You've got two vehicles for the whole park. For the whole park. <laughs> now, for me to drive from here to yeah. come and see my other stuff here, mm. it takes me almost a month. Yeah. yeah. Right now, I'm only going on about 81 wildlife scouts to man this area. That's just peanuts. You've got how many? 81. 81. For the entire 81. park. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Definitely, this park will not need less than 300 scouts yeah. to man it, strictly right. speaking. Mm -hmm. It's a vast area. Zambia is committed to protecting its wildlife, but faces severe economic problems. The population is doubling every 20 years. As land is cleared, wildlife habitats are wiped out. Commercial poaching destroys animals that could be a renewable resource on a continent starved for protein. Many conservationists believe that African wildlife can be saved only if people who live near the parks benefit from them in tangible ways. Ray Mwenefumbo suggests that the Owens visit a village nearby to learn what the villagers think. Boys watch from a respectful distance as Delia and Mark meet Chief Shizongo. At this point, we are very naive about your problems. How do you think we could help? We want to see practical things that people near the park, mm -hmm. at least, see the need for these animals. We would like to see that the local population is taken into account. Mm -hmm. Yes, we get benefit on national level, mm -hmm. yes. but an ordinary person like me doesn't see yes. what shares we have. Particularly people who are next to the wildlife, the district yes, should yes. benefit much, not well, as it is at the moment. Yes. Have you spoken to the government about this? Uh, not at government. all. At present, they are only interested in looking after the tourists, but not the local people. Mm -hmm. We are isolated. Mm -hmm. We are nothing to them. The Owens know that the government of Zambia is beginning to share tourist and hunting revenue with villagers. <laughs> But this important reform has yet to be initiated here. This is this lion is the one whose leg was broken here, yes. Pictures in their book help Mark and the villagers establish common ground and understanding. You see, we could get very close to them. They would walk up to us. The same lion. This is this cub, Bimbo, when he is two years old now. And he walked up and nearly smelled my face here. Well, they tamed the lions. No, no, they were wild lions. <laughs> <laughs> but these lions would come into camp and they'd sit at the campfire. Wild lions. <laughs> Hard to believe. Maybe lions of Botswana are different from ours here. No, that these lions have never been hunted, you see. That's the difference. Those lions in Botswana can be very mean if they're hunted. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Delia and Mark are perhaps the first Americans ever to visit Shizongo village. Reason enough for a celebration. Dancing goes on for hours. For seven years in the Kalahari, Delia and Mark lived isolated lives, at home with animals, but far from people. This moving evening is an exciting first for them. Deep within the wilderness on the Kafui River, there is an especially lush area, unvisited in recent years because bridges and roads are out. They make this area their goal. Along the way, they find seas of grass, but curiously, the vegetation seems untouched by grazing animals.
The few antelope they do see run as the land cruiser approaches. This is like an Eden with nothing here, mm -hmm. with everything gone. And it, you know, I, I just more or less come to the conclusion as we, we're driving down this last stretch here that it's got to be poaching. Everything we've seen has been wild. Mm -hmm. I know, everything. we've only seen a few animals and they run away from us. And there's grass here to beat and there are no animals to eat it. Then a chance encounter with a volunteer game scout, Tony Middleton. But still, I kept thinking, there. we both kept thinking there must be more, there should be more animals. There should be more. Should Even be now, there should yeah. be more. And on the elephant one, I promise you, here you would drive and you see two, three hundred in the afternoon, elephant. Three Is years that ago. right? Yeah. Three, three years, years ago. ago. Three years ago. Right. Three years ago, the northern half of the park was really heavily poached for ivory, mm -hmm. and the elephant actually moved down into this particular area. Mm -hmm. Now they're going for the lesser the animals meat, because it's now meat. meat poaching. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. We've got the commercial meat po poaching uh, hand in hand with the ivory poaching. Mm -hmm. Are the poachers coming in with trucks? No, it's all by foot. But you see, you'll get two or three guys come into an area like this and they'll set up a camp, hide somewhere. Yeah. And then they will just shoot, 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 shoot. And they will cut up the meat or cut out the ivory. And then once a week, once every fortnight, you'll get 10, 12, 15 chaps coming from the villages on the other side with bicycles, quick movement, uh, loaded up and off they go. Yeah. Unless something drastic is done on a national scale, we are not going to have any wildlife left in this country in 10 years. Still hoping to find an area free of poaching, Delia and Mark plunge ever deeper into the wilderness toward the river. Uh -oh. Their route is often blocked by streams. We shouldn't have to go far west before we cut north, but you know, I think what we're gonna have to do is decide, go maybe a kilometer, because pretty soon this is not gonna be worth it. We no, have to decide. Gotta, well, we, we, have to get a, we have to get away from these, this, We've got to get away from these rocks and these yeah. copies out here before we can do anything yeah. in a straight line, so... But we, you know, I know. Well, we can't go back now. We've got to go on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Look, I don't think you can get through that way. Trust me. Forging on toward their river goal, Delia and Mark face one difficulty after the other. Do you see anything, Mark? What? Do you see anything? No. So what do you think we did wrong? Well, the only thing I can think of is that we stayed left when we should have, I mean, we branched right when we should have stayed left. Because this track hasn't matched the one that's on the chart at all. It can take all day to drive around some small streams. In four days, they travel just 50 miles. See that little cut in the bank there? Yeah. I wonder if there's any hope there. A tourist camp, burned out by poachers. Abandoned now because it cannot be protected. It doesn't look like the camp was even that old. I mean, the mud daub and so forth doesn't look it doesn't look like it had been done very long ago. This is heavy duty stuff, you know. Well, this could be us. Yeah, well, it just sounds, I mean, if we have a camp here, we have to have an armed guard at our camp. And at the airplane, and at the boats, and at the vehicles. The sight of the burned out camp is sobering. Poacher's tracks add a sense of present danger. Mark, just don't follow those four, okay? Just um, come on back because I'm worried that th they probably have guns and you're in there alone, over. Yeah, and they're following them right down the damn stream bed, right up the stream bed. Deeply discouraged, but too far into the wilderness to turn back, Delia and Mark push on to the river. They had hoped this might be their next home. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, man. Look at it. Oh, God. Wow, what a spot.
What the hell is that thing? We've made it to the river, but look it at this. For thing. drying fish or for drying meat. I don't see any fish bones. It's, it's a meat drying rack. It's poaching. I can smell the meat on it. I mean, this is just about the most discouraging place I've seen in a long time. The whole bloody park is being sterilized by it. You, you really. I can't use it again, anyway. Such a furnace. We need to know that somebody was here. We need to put a warning. At least they'll have to go to more trouble next time. They want to dry the meat. Their frustration and anger mount as they discover more and more evidence of slaughter. In some areas, elephant skulls litter the ground. You can stand in this spot and you can see four to five dead elephants. I think it's despicable, I think it's appalling, I think it's a tragic commentary on the state of world conservation that this sort of thing can go on. And I just keep wondering when the world's going to wake up and really take some action. Mark's frustration is fueled by the knowledge that in just 12 years, 100,000 elephants in the Luangwa Valley have been killed. They're being destroyed for their ivory, which is carved into trinkets, coffee table decorations, and works of art. The fashion that leads people to buy ivory, collect it, and wear it, contributes to the destruction of these magnificent creatures. Distressed by what they have seen, Delia and Mark search further. They've been told that North Luangwa National Park is still an untouched wilderness. They make a flying reconnaissance. That's a beautiful river. Yeah, beautiful river. <laughs> we can work this habitat, too, especially along the river channels. It looks quite open. It looks very possible in terms of moving around with a truck. And I think, I think I'll be able to spot from the airplane quite well, too. Yeah, this place is full of animals. You know what? Full of animals. Yeah. Look for lions. People have said this is the Cinderella Park of Zambia. I believe it. Yeah. It needs work. They don't know how many animals there are. It needs quantitative work. You know, we saw so lions. And yeah, we saw <laughs> lions, three females with three little cubs, and uh, wild dogs. What have I got, pseudomonas? <laughs> Only one track leads down the escarpment into the Rift Valley. Delia will drive it alone. Mark flies down with the airplane, and when he lands, is greeted by a forlorn sight. <laughs> My forlorn little boo. <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad you're not hurt. I don't know what happened. Listen, I couldn't have done it better myself. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> See the trailers in line? It was perfect. And then it just took off on its own. <laughs> well, I climbed out of there in a hurry. I believe. You came out like a jack-in-the-box. <laughs> <laughs> you can check the gear oil, really. I, yeah, I can, grease, I can grease the drivetrain and um, <laughs> check the springs. <laughs> I I'm guess we should sorry. approve it. I think I'll have a puree water with lime, ice, and um, shrimp cocktails served on the half an avocado. Quiet. And then, what, shall we have cheesecake with, with cherries on top? Here she goes!
what a difference as they travel this track. These animals have not yet learned to fear man. But North Luangwa Park, for lack of manpower and resources, is virtually defenseless. It could go the way of Kafui in just a few years unless Zambia, together with the international community, commits greater resources to its protection. Paradise, for Delia and Mark, is a place where the lions are unconcerned by their presence. Never see a desert lion up this time of day, mm -hmm. moving around. She's really used to us now, Mark. She's just ignoring us. Mm -hmm. Look at the cuckoo across the river. This place excites me. Yeah. It really does. Good to be watching lions again. I think maybe we found a home. Yeah. Here is a place where two research scientists could dedicate 10 years of their lives and hope to make a difference. I want to get in the water. Oh, why? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Than we saw in seven years in the Kalahari. I think we should get some. If we can't sunburn. be happy here, I say I don't. I don't think there's a place left in there. Mm. Well, this is great. <laughs> you can at least take your boots off. <laughs> can you imagine living next to water mm. and without people? Not a game. And oh man, I, you know the thing is about this place is there's a lot here to to work with and to you know to. It's a place where you can sort of put your heart and be happy for years. Delia and Mark Owen started out 13 years ago with a passion for wildlife, with extraordinary pluck, and with the hope that they could make a contribution to the preservation of a precious heritage. They stood up for conservation and paid a heavy personal and professional price. The way has been hard. The future is uncertain. But still, they hold steadfast to their dream. Thank mm -hmm. you.